If you were sent into a battlefield with a horde of infected mutants, what would you do? These soldiers are in for the surprise of their life, and there's no escaping their superhuman abilities. I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the mutant soldiers in Overlord. These commandos are going to regret coming to France, getting ready to fight the German army. These men joke around and relax before entering the scariest event these soldiers have ever faced. The photographer here approaches this quiet man and snaps a picture, introducing himself as Chase, and asking if he can take another photo of the man. The corporal refuses to have any more photos taken, while the other soldiers comment on how quiet he is, mentioning that he was transferred onto their platoon at the last minute, with no idea that only three of these men will survive. This soldier asks Boyce here for a pack of gum, and the paratrooper takes it out, but drops his things on the ground. That's when this man Tippett notices that he dropped a chain and picks it up, teasing the man for his lucky charm. Boyce demands the chain be given back as the soldier insists that it was only a joke. That's when their sergeant walks inside and asks their drop zone and target. Being told that they're headed for the village of Ciel Blanc in France, with their target being to destroy a radio jamming tower on a church near the town center. The sergeant asks Boyce why the tower would be placed on a church, but the nervous man is too slow to respond. He announces that it's because their enemies are pure evil, demanding his men to do anything in their power to take them out. He informs them that 120,000 allied soldiers will be joining them on the beach attack, and they need to take out this tower by 6 a.m. or else. He introduces the others to the explosives expert, Corporal Ford, and orders them to obey his every command, reminding them that the drop is only 90 minutes away. Flying through a barrage of explosions, the men put their gear on and panic begins to settle in. The leader informs them to stay calm and jump out when the light turns green. The plane flies downwards, with friendly vehicles being shot down all around. Suddenly, a hail of bullets shoots straight through the plane and hit this soldier, forcing the medic to rush over and try to help the fatally wounded man. All hell is breaking loose, and this is just the beginning. Okay, this man here is just one of many soldiers that needs to make it down onto land to take out a church tower as a part of a special mission to help allied forces beat the Germans and end the war. Bullets are flying and killing people left, right, and center. And once this soldier gets on the ground, he's only bound to face more enemy attacks. He needs to protect himself at all costs from these bullets. But just like all the other men here, he's trapped in this plane with no safe way to escape. This is not good, and he needs to think fast to protect himself against injury. If it were me, my initial instinct would be to jump here. This is a horrible situation and getting out of it as fast as possible seems like the right move. Everyone's options are limited because of the compact space, and just by sitting here, I could take a bullet to the face. However, the problem with jumping is that the plane is still very high above ground right now. The plane is so high that there are other planes that are below them. Not only would it be difficult to navigate around any enemy bullets that are aiming to kill me, but having to navigate around these planes would be near impossible after releasing my parachute. We could try to go to the cockpit and do our best to steer the plane, either angling it upwards or downwards. This would minimize the overall profile of the vehicle and make it harder for the flat guns below to hit us. Now, Boyce here is a draftee with three months of training, and it's not clear if he has any skills in piloting, but in a desperate situation, I'd be willing to do anything for my survival. With that said, we can't stay inside the plane that's being shot down, but we're also in danger of being ripped apart by bullets. That's why I'd consider holding off and jumping out and instead try to protect myself by getting as low to the ground as possible in a crouching position, protecting all of my vital organs. The soldiers here have helmets and military gear on, and from the looks of it, they're not totally working. However, my best chances are trying to strengthen the use of this protective gear by making my vital organs harder to reach. This situation is made even more difficult because the men don't know where these bolts are coming from. The windows on this plane have been closed to protect the soldiers from further exposure, but it also makes it so that there is no way of anticipating where the next attack is coming from. By placing myself in the fetal position on the ground, it physically makes me have a smaller profile and helps me avoid getting hit by bullets. As more and more people are hit by bullets, I would take bodies and line them on either side of me to create a protective human shield around me as the plane gets closer to the ground. Any moment that the bullets let up, I would also strip dead soldiers of their protective gear to put on top of my own. It's better to be safe than sorry, and it doesn't seem like these guys have been properly equipped with what they have already. Layering here is the best option. Eventually, I would make my way closer to the door to see how close we are to the ground. Then, once there's a clear path to below me, I'll say my prayers and make the jump. The soldiers brace themselves for landing with the indicator to jump signaling itself and the crew is given no choice but to jump now. The plane is blown to bits, and Boyce here can barely manage to hold on. His crewmate grabs the shaken men, throwing them off into a barrage of bullets and explosions, while he struggles to pull his parachute, activating at the final second.
naked. He falls deep into the water and is forced to cut the cord to free himself. He quickly takes off his backpack and swims as fast as he can to the surface. He survived the first part of this invasion, but the man has no idea that the real enemies aren't normal soldiers. Running into the forest, he finds a working rifle and notices a sergeant being surrounded by a group of Germans. The man is determined to rescue him, but suddenly Corporal Ford covers his mouth from behind. That's when the sergeant is brutally shot down and the Germans move on, making that one commando down with six more to go. Later, the Americans continue on to Seal Blanc, and Ford mentions that he hasn't seen any of the soldiers from their plane. The men notice a figure in the distance, readying their guns before realizing they're friendlies. The paratroopers discuss their remaining supplies, and Ford here comments on the photographer Chase's camera, surprised that he managed to keep it during the fall. Complimenting the device, he asks to take a look and throws it into the forest, warning that it would easily reveal their location. Later, they walk through an open field making small talk, when suddenly one of the men, Dawson, steps on a landmine, and the entire group is knocked down. That makes two commandos down with five more to go. Rattled, Boyce grabs his gun and looks around to see his men struggling to recover. Ford here demands that he walk towards him in a straight line and avoid any more hidden explosives. Getting up, he uses the bayonet to check for bombs and walks towards the other men, horrified that the mission is already going so badly. Washing blood off their faces, Boyce here reflects on losing another friend, while the corporal tells him to get a move on. The soldiers find the strange disfigured creature on the ground and realize that this isn't an animal that they've ever seen before. That's when they hear someone coming, spotting this French woman Chloe walking through the woods, who notices the soldiers and runs off. They're forced to chase her through the forest before she tries to fight back. Speaking French, Boyce insists that she's safe, and Ford here questions if Seal Blanc is her village. The lady nods, being given back her knife, and is told to lead the way. Okay, there are landmines everywhere. Dawson has already been blown to bits, and the remaining soldiers don't know if this lady here is a friend or foe. They need to get out of this field as fast as possible, but they also have to find a place to hide until they can devise a plan to take out the church tower. Right now, they need to figure out a way to avoid getting blown up, but are super limited based on their options. Now, the remaining soldiers could use Chloe as a landmine detector and have her walk out in front of them first to see if she blows up first. This would be the fastest and most effective way of seeing if the road ahead is safe, but since she's the only one that knows how to get to her village, she's still too useful to them to risk losing. Chloe also may be an ally to the men, and they don't know yet if she's against the Germans as well. She did lash out when the soldiers first found her, but now that she knows that they aren't going to kill her, she's willing to guide them. If it were me, I would follow Chloe, but not let her get too far ahead in case she's going to notify enemy troops of our whereabouts. Since Chloe is only armed with a knife, and the soldiers have rifles, I'm also better armed than she is, and have a better chance of surviving her attacking me than me shooting her. Rather than charging ahead through the fields, I would take off my helmet and roll it out in front of me first to see if there are any landmines ahead. This would be tedious and would take time, but it's the safest way to ensure our safety. Throwing something wouldn't work because the object wouldn't touch the entire path ahead, and the object would hit the ground with a thud, drawing attention to us. The helmet is the roundest object the soldiers have, and if spun on the ground in front of them like a top, it will reach a few feet ahead. They can then walk that distance and repeat the action. The main problem with this is that it will take time, and the soldiers don't know how far ahead or close behind the enemy is, so I would climb a tree to get a better view of the landscape. The soldiers here are surrounded by tall trees, and even though it's foggy, choosing the highest tree and climbing it can definitely reveal how far away the village is. This also can confirm for us whether or not Chloe is to be trusted. Since it's nighttime, and the Germans are better prepared here, some may have lights on or fires going, which will show us exactly where not to walk. This will allow us the opportunity to move slowly enough that we won't get blown up, but also give us a better understanding of how far ahead we need to go to get to safety. The group carefully walks through the open field and into the village of Seal Blanc to find most of it in ruins. Chloe here tells Boyce that her house is up ahead, but they can't be seen. Her younger brother and aunt are currently inside. Corporal Ford tells the two to stay behind while he checks with the others to see if Chloe here is telling the truth. Worried, she rushes out while a stranger in this house calls out to see who's there. Boyce hides in the trenches while Chloe talks to her neighbor and pretends that it's only her outside. Suddenly, the neighbor blows a whistle to signal that somebody's out past curfew. Chloe insists that she'll go home, but runs into these soldiers. They begin pushing her around until their leader interrupts, giving back her large back and letting Chloe go. That's when Boyce here sneaks out of the trenches and finds his buddies taking cover. Suddenly, the French woman reappears, revealing that she speaks English, and makes it clear that she hates the German soldiers occupying her village. Inviting them into her home, the Americans walk inside and hear her sickly aunt howling in pain. It's strange, and as this soldier turns around, he's shocked to see her younger brother armed with a rifle. Heading into the attic, the soldiers analyze their surroundings, noticing a 
lot of German movement outside. Questioning the woman on the compound, she informs them that patrol trucks go in and out, but civilians will be shot if they go anywhere near it. Ford decides they need to take the opportunity to sneak in while there's a gap in their defenses. They need to place explosives on the targeted radio tower, and Ford asks for the sniper Tibbet to keep the machine gunners off them if they're spotted in the compound. Suddenly, they hear a commotion outside and look to see two civilians being detained before one of them is shot dead on the spot. Ford tells the lady that his squad needs to stay here for around four more hours until the time reaches 6 a.m., giving them the opportunity to strike. Chase here recommends they stay inside for the time being, mentioning there's too many soldiers outside right now, but Boyce interrupts, pointing out that the tower needs to be destroyed or else air support won't arrive. Furious, Tippett insults the man for finally speaking up and insists that he's too much of a whip to be here. The corporal orders him to stop fighting and check if anyone else made it to the rally point along with Chase, making sure to return by 3 a.m. The family heads downstairs while the corporal orders Boyce to keep a lookout on the ground floor. Reluctantly, he leaves the attic, but as he's walking, the man hears the ant violently coughing and decides to take a look. Approaching the door, he hears the noise from behind, looking back and forth, when suddenly he's shocked to see the ant is completely disfigured. Chloe surprises him and tells the man that the woman was taken away by the Germans, but hasn't spoken a single word since she returned. The French woman decides to clean his wounds, and as she's bandaging him, reveals that she went to study in London, but was forced to return when the war happened. She introduces her younger brother, Paul, who offers to play ball with him. Wanting to know more about her, the soldier asks about Chloe's history with the Germans, and she explains that her father was taken, with her mother being taken soon after. She mentions that a scientist who has been using the tar found beneath the village to run experiments believes it has some supernatural power, but the woman thinks that it's just an excuse to kill her people. That's when they hear the Germans knocking on her door, and the soldier goes to hide in the attic. Reluctantly, Chloe opens up to see the military officer Waffner asking to come in, walking into the house, and commenting on a disappointing night at work. He turns around and forces the lady to fix up his collar, noticing that Chloe is nervously looking up at the ceiling. Finding it strange, the leader comments that she hasn't cooked her usual dinner, but the lady pretends that she was too busy helping her sickly aunt. He strokes her hair, but Chloe refuses to get intimate with the man, when suddenly he loses his temper and orders his subordinates inside the house. The leader questions where her brother went, but then the boy's baseball falls down the stairs. The soldiers head upstairs and find the kid at the staircase. He rolls a ball down to the Germans, but the guy spits on it before throwing it back. The leader's subordinates inform him that it's only the child, and he threatens to have the boy experimented on like her aunt, unless Chloe wants the man to stay, forcing her to give him a peck on the cheek. The woman tells him to stay here, but he's just made a terrible mistake. Okay, Chloe here is in serious danger, and she's not only helped the soldiers find shelter, but has proven herself a major ally against the Germans. She has suffered like the rest of the people in her village, and saving people like her and taking back France from the occupying force is the exact reason the allies are there in the first place. The soldiers want to help, but they also don't want to reveal their whereabouts to the enemy. If they were me, I would attack the German leader while he's distracted and take him hostage. The soldiers upstairs have the advantage in the situation, because the German officer has no reason to believe they're there. The soldiers have have already been inside to inspect the place, and they've left without seeing the Americans. The leader has his guard down, and he's totally outnumbered. Attacking him and taking him hostage is a no-brainer, and the worst-case scenario is if the leader screams and yells for help. But if his life is in danger, he'll be motivated to keep quiet. The men can then gag him until they figure out what to do with him. Now, this is where it gets tricky. The men here now have to decide what to do with him. If he stays alive, any number of things can happen. He can escape and harm them, or eventually grow weary of being their prisoner, and decide it's not worth it to live and call out for the other German soldiers, bringing attention to himself and the Americans. Killing him would solve all these problems, but he could have valuable information that would help the soldiers on their mission. Drawing out that information would take time, and who knows how useful it will be, since this man can't be trusted. His last dying wish could be to throw us off the German scent and put us in more danger further down the line. If it were me, though, I would go ahead and kill the German leader. This officer is ruthless and was just about to attack Chloe here. I have to take down the radio tower by 6 a.m. the next day, and we are running out of time. Keeping him here and trying to figure out what to do with him is only a liability, and who knows what he will do if he escapes. It may sound brutal, but these men are in the middle of a war, and it's more likely this guy is going to be more trouble than he's going to be helpful. Killing him eliminates the threat, and also helps us move on to the next task as quickly as possible. Before he's killed, the woman could try to appeal to him one more time to see why they're taking her friends and family. 
but at this point, it's unlikely that she'll be able to get anything out of them. Boy sneaks downstairs and points his gun into the back of this man's head. Corporal Ford punches him in the face and searches for any hidden weapons. He takes out a lighter from his pocket, commenting that it must have been a get for killing a certain number of enemy soldiers. Ford knocks the leader out and scolds Boyce for putting the mission in jeopardy, demanding that he go find the others now. Boyce runs outside to the outer edge of the German-occupied compound, watching as some soldiers start dumping dozens of disfigured bodies onto the ground. Suddenly, they set fire to the bodies, and Boyce here runs away from the scene. As he's crossing a road, he's nearly caught by a passing truck and dives into the bushes, but he's found by a dog. With no other choice, he's forced to run to the back of the truck and realizes it's full of dead soldiers. Shocked, he looks outside to see that he's being taken inside the compound. Now he's all alone, and an army of German soldiers will shoot on sight if he's found. After the truck comes to a stop, Boyce quickly sneaks out of the vehicle and crawls beneath it. He finds his way to the separate tunnel, while being careful not to be spotted by any Germans. The man reaches this locked gate and hears a terrifying noise behind him, seeing these holes in the wall. Looking through one, the man watches someone struggling to escape, but then hears the sound of footsteps getting closer. Quickly finding a place to hide, a researcher walks in to check on his patient as he screams in agony. That's when Boyce walks back to check on him and sees a disfigured face up against the wall. Continuing through the compound, he looks over into another room, seeing dozens of soldiers working their shifts. The man makes into this laboratory, looking around confused by the strange devices and a huge vat of tar. He opens up this body bag, which reveals a disfigured patient who's still alive. The paratrooper quickly sneaks away and watches as a scientist moves a large vial of red liquid. Looking around, Boyce notices a handful of syringes when he hears a woman calling out. It's strange, and he puts the injector into his pocket before moving into this room, where he discovers a French woman's dismembered head is somehow still alive. Shocked, he walks away and finds one of his crewmates tied to this bed. Suddenly, the lights turn on and Boyce hides, watching as the scientists inject this dead man with a chemical, and he suddenly starts moving again. They place the man inside a morgue slab, and as soon as they're gone, Boyce begins untying his crewmates' restraints. That's when he grabs this large pump attached to his body and removes it from his stomach. After freeing him, he takes the man through another hallway while avoiding being spotted by Germans. But that's when they hear a guard shouting that there's an intruder. Looking around, Boyce spots a small vent and manages to break it open before sneaking out of the compound. Okay, something seriously messed up is happening here. The Allied forces knew that the Axis forces were carrying out cruel acts of violence, but they didn't know just how cruel. The experiments that are being carried out here are not of this world, and the people that are still alive and are not zombies are suffering immensely. Boyce here has seen it all, and thankfully he was able to get Jacob out while he still could. The best case scenario is if the men could go back and save all of these poor people that have been experimented on, but just getting his friend out was an act of sheer willpower. Going back to save them would be far too dangerous, and many of them have been altered and mutated so much that the Germans have sealed them away to drain their test subjects of this red liquid. The others that are there have been turned into complete zombies, and would only try to kill them if released. However, it would be super useful to the Allied forces to know where this entrance is in the future to get back here and infiltrate the lab to kill the Germans. So if it were me, I would leave markers to find my way back later. Rather than just walking home, I would take my shirt and rip it up into little pieces so I could use the strips of cloth to tie around tree branches. We would have to space them out carefully as there are dogs here, but as long as we tie our markers strategically from each other, neither the guard dogs or their handlers will notice. That way, once we've regrouped the other soldiers, we can come back here and execute a plan of attack. Horrific acts are being carried out in this lab, and the men could kill all the Germans there, preventing them from hurting anyone else if they get their hands on an explosive device. A grenade will only do so much and draw attention to themselves if it doesn't kill everyone in their vicinity, so they need to find or make an even bigger explosive device to take the whole thing down. This is an ideal plan because nobody is guarding the entrance. Not only has it been completely forgotten about, but before Boyce and Jacob got there, it was overgrown with vines and was only reachable through a sewer system that led back into the lab. To create an explosive device, the men could improvise using household items to create a makeshift bomb from Chloe's house. They could then come back to this entrance and re-enter through the sewers, completely undisturbed, and be let out in the middle of the lab. None of the zombies will have been released this time, and so as long as the coast is clear, the men have a direct shot at taking down this lab getting one step closer to ending the occupier's control. The Germans also have no reason to believe they are in any immediate danger, since I've re-entered the lab without disturbing them. If I wear the German leader's uniform from before, I should be able to plant it as close to the church tower as possible, so it does the maximum damage. But the other thing is that this lab is full of all kinds of crazy liquids and devices. Once the bomb has gone off, who knows what will happen to these other liquids creating maximum damage and completing the mission. 
Back at Chloe's house, the Americans get into an argument over who left the boys behind when they hear him arrive downstairs with the injured soldier Rosenfeld. The man explains that he woke up with all these devices in his body, and the corporal questions boys on how he managed to get inside the church. The paratrooper explains that he snuck in with a convoy of dead bodies, and the Germans are experimenting on the villagers, burning them with flamethrowers and injecting the tar into their disfigured bodies. Ford calms them down, clarifying if he saw the tower compound in person, and that's when he reveals that the tower base is underground before pulling out the syringe he found inside. They confront the German man on what this could be, and he reveals that even he doesn't know as an officer. The corporal calls his bluff, and Boyce informs him that he saw the Germans burning people right in front of his eyes. Ford kicks the officer and forces him to spit out the truth. The man tells him the villagers have been given a purpose, and insults them for being useless up until the army arrive. Furious, Chloe stabs him, and the paratroopers take her away. Ford decides to put aside the mysterious syringe, and leaves the knife right beside the German's head. Boyce walks down to talk with a French woman, who admits she hates how the war changed her, and he comforts her, insisting he's in the same boat. That's when Ford interrupts, revealing that there are 40 men guarding the wall, making it almost impossible to pass through safely, and orders the sniper to keep them busy while they rig the tower. With one hour left until their soldiers hit the beach, Ford asks the woman for a vehicle, and is told that she has one in the garage. The corporal tells his team to bring down the officer, and Chase here goes upstairs to find the German hanging limply from the ceiling. Confused, the man lowers him to the floor and believes he might be dead. Suddenly, the German trips the soldier and jumps onto him before taking the man's gun and finally shooting Chase. Boyce rushes upstairs and tackles him to the ground while the others check out Chase's wounds. They tell him to calm down and wash off his blood, applying medicine to the terrible injuries. That's when the soldier stops breathing, and now they've just lost one of their own. But then Boyce notices the syringe. It gives him a clever idea, and he grabs it before injecting the chemical into the dead body, but nothing happens. Confused, Ford tells him to get up and focus on the mission, when suddenly, Chase rises back up and comments that he's thirsty. The group is shocked to see a dead man come back to life, realizing that these Germans have something terrifying in their arsenal. Ford asks him to stand up, and the soldier mentions that he's feeling extremely hot. Suddenly, his veins begin to expand, and he breaks the wooden beam next to him. The soldiers have no idea what's going on, and it's about to get much worse. Okay, the men have luckily made it back alive from the lab, but there's not much else good about the situation. The German leader is still alive, and Chase has just died and been brought back to life with a super fluid that the Germans are using on the villagers and their own soldiers. If it were me, I definitely wouldn't have stabbed Chase in the lake here with a super fluid. Yes, he was dead, and it's unimaginable that anything worse can happen, but Boyce has just witnessed that the unimaginable can absolutely happen back at the lab, and nothing good can come from using fluid from that lab. It's not like he was just at the doctor's office and saw a bunch of people being healed. He witnessed a lady with just a head and no body, as well as the bubonic zombies. Nothing good can come from using anything in the lab, and keeping it away from both his friends and this German leader here is the only way to survive. Chase is about to undergo something horrific, and the men will have to think only of themselves. The other thing is the soldiers need to kill this German leader. Sure, he's told them pieces of information about what's happening in the lab, but not more than what they could have already been concluded by what boys saw. He's just shot Chase, and keeping him alive isn't going to be helpful to the soldiers moving forward. The light outside is starting to shift the daylight, and they can't encounter any more problems if they want to complete their mission on time. If it were me, I would fatally shoot the German soldier immediately and do whatever it takes to kill Chase once he transforms into the monster he's about to become. The other thing that these soldiers are forgetting is that this woman, Chloe's aunt, has been experimented on and is just several steps away from them in another room. Rather than try to get information out of the German officer, they could go and try to get intel from the aunt. According to Chloe, she hasn't spoken since she returned, but she hasn't been fully transformed since she hasn't tried to kill anyone, and may not have spoken about the lab because what she saw and experienced was too unreal and unimaginable to articulate. Now that these men have seen the same thing, they can try to talk to her and draw her out for any other information she might have to help them take down the German soldiers. The men already know a good way back in, but since she spent more time there, she could help them draw a map of the inside of the facility to make moving through it easier. It's possible she may have picked up on the doctor and soldier's schedules so they can also be avoided when the men re-enter the facility. Suddenly, the soldier's own bones pierce through his skin, and the corporal decides that they need to kill him. Boyce tries to calm the situation down, but the mutated man grabs him and demands to know what was inside the syringe. The others try to stop their friend, but are too weak, and Chase throws him around the room as he continues to mutate into a monster. Ford stands up and fires a bunch of bullets into Chase, killing him. That's when he gets back up, but Boyce here knocks the man over and completely demolishes his head. That makes three commandos down, with four more to go. With the men distracted, the German leader takes the French woman's brother and runs off with them before the American soldiers can react. 
Ford runs outside revealing himself to the enemy troopers and firing off multiple shots in his direction, but is forced to take cover. Tibbet shoots one of the soldiers from above while the officer returns to fire. That's when Ford comes from the side and manages to nail the German officer in his face before clearing out the remaining enemies. Horrified, Chloe runs out to find her little brother, but he's already been taken away. Ford demands that they take down the radio tower now, with Boyce climbing the target with them. Boyce questions what happened to the lady's younger brother, placing the blame on himself for the missing child. Ford doesn't care about anything else, insisting that they find the tower and destroy it. The paratrooper refuses to leave without saving the kid, but his corporal gives him a stern order to follow him. That's when Boyce decides to take matters into his own hands, telling him that he can sneak them inside, blowing up the tower from below, destroying the labs, and rescuing Paul all in one trip. Hearing this, Ford laughs, agreeing to his subordinate's plan. They begin planning out their route inside of the compound, first mentioning that the tunnel entrance is down a slope, which two squad members need to act as a distraction. Ford and Boyce will head inside, while the others give them time to rescue the kid. That's when they begin the operation, with Chloe here coming out of her house and letting herself be spotted by German soldiers. She's chased out of the town by one of them and sprints deep into the forest to lure him away. The woman is stopped on this bridge and acts innocent before the man pushes her to the ground, not realizing that the Americans are right behind him. They knock him down and send the man driving back into the compound with his mouth taped shut. Suspicious, a guard holds him still before another German soldier removes the tape and rips off the pin of a grenade. Suddenly, the soldiers realize that he brought a bomb into their base and sprint away as it blows up in a massive explosion. The sniper and Rosenfeld fire behind the cover of the trees, but they're spotted by the enemy who retaliate with a machine gun. Tibbet manages to hit the gunner, but reinforcements are coming their way. Meanwhile, in the drainage line, the others travel through this dark tunnel and wait as the enemy soldiers pass by. The group climbs out of their hiding place, and Chloe questions when they're going to find her brother. Ford tells her that they need to rig the place with explosives before looking for the boy, but she refuses and runs off to look for Paul. She runs to these German soldiers and holds them up at gunpoint, demanding to know where her brother is. The man tells her that he has no idea before being shot down by the lady, and she asks his friend the same question. In the communications room, Ford here stabs the radio operator and orders boys to go find the lab, mentioning that they only have 20 minutes until reinforcements storm the beach, but is going to set the timer for only 18. That means there's only two minutes to escape, and anyone who doesn't will instantly be killed. Meanwhile, Chloe forces the soldier to open up her brother's holding room and carefully watches the man, but when she checks inside the cell, the woman finds body parts inside. The German is about to shoot her, but is intercepted by Boyce, who insists that her brother isn't here. They're about to run off when they see the soldier get pulled inside the holding room and quickly leave the prison with no idea that a terrifying monster is about to come for them. Okay, the American soldiers have made it back inside and have successfully set the timer to go off in two minutes before the Allied reinforcements are meant to hit the beach. They have two objectives at this point, keep the timer set and get out alive. That means that to make sure the timers are safe, they'll need to keep enemies like the German officer out of the control room and escape from the building quickly. Once Ford is done setting up the explosives, he should exit out through the same doors that Boyce exits to find Chloe, because from the looks of it, there are only three ways to get into the control room, and he needs to seal off two of them to make it harder for anyone else to get in there and undo his work. The first exits we should target are the doorway into the operations room and down a ladder surrounded by a cage. The ladder is the easier of the two, since this appears to have been added to build and access the radio jamming tower. To get rid of this one, Ford needs to open the cage door to this ladder and kick it from where it's welded. If he climbs up on it and kicks the cage connected to it, he should be able to dislodge it from its location. He should then climb back down and rip it from the wall, making it impossible for others to enter the room. In the event that fails, using one of these desks to block the cage door from opening would make make it impossible for someone to open it from the inside. That leaves the doorway in the tunnel into the operations room, and this one is a little trickier. We are trying our best to get the job done fast before the allies attack, and the easiest thing to do would have been to barricade this door with Boyce's help, stacking the desks on top of each other. Once that's done, he then needs to exit through the same exit as Boyce and detonate a high explosive grenade in the hallway to bring down the structure around him, making a barricade out of rubble. Now, the German officer has been injected with the super soldier serum, and the only hope of keeping him away is making it as difficult as possible to get in. This may not even completely keep him out, but it'll at least slow him down, and with only 18 minutes to spare, he'll be working against the clock too. Now, Ford has to do this far enough away from the control room so he doesn't destroy his own work, but close enough that it blocks off the narrow pathway into the room. The second issue that Boyce and Ford have here is they need to make it out alive. The three of them should divide and conquer to find Paul as quickly as possible, and rendezvous back at the secret exit through the sewers that's connected to the room that Chloe is in with the zombies. This is the best place to exit from because it's the closest to them right now, and they know that there's nobody on the other side to detain them. This is going to be made more difficult by the fact that there's a zombie on the loose. These suckers are gross and hard to beat, but we know from killing
and chase that destroying the head is the surefire way to get rid of them. The men should use the last of their grenades, working together to pin the zombie down and blow its brains to smithereens by forcing a grenade into its mouth with the pin removed. The men will have to move fast and run from the zombie because they're not particularly smart, so once they release the grenade, it will blow them up instantly, giving the men the opportunity to escape back to freedom. Entering the laboratory, Chloe looks under these body sheets to find Paul tied down to a table. She frees him from his restraints and tells boys to come along with her, but the paratrooper insists that he needs to finish the mission. The woman leaves and the soldier heads back upstairs, when suddenly something dashes right behind him, while Chloe and her brother begin to escape through this vent. Suddenly, one of the test subjects grabs Chloe from behind and drags the woman out out of the tunnel, sending her rolling across the floor. She quickly fires off multiple shots, but they have no effect on the creature. It quickly pushes her against a wall, and the disfigured man tries to bite her neck open. With all her strength, Chloe pushes the man away and shoots him through the head. He collapses to the ground and violently convulses in pain. She walks away, but then realizes that he's not dead yet, and runs as fast as she can. Chloe enters this underground tunnel and finds a flamethrower that's been stashed away. The woman quickly grabs the weapon and puts it on. When the test subject catches up, she sets him on fire and burns him to death. Meanwhile, Corporal Ford finishes setting the timers, but discovers that Officer Waffner has survived. He's taken the super soldier serum and grabs the man before throwing him straight into a cage. The American tries to pull out his gun, but the German grabs it and slams him against a steel beam. In the laboratory, Boyce is setting up the explosives, but that's when the scientist approaches him and points a gun at him from behind. The man tries to order him around, but Boyce quickly disarms the man and pushes him against the wall. Getting into a fight, the two of them end up throwing themselves on the ground, but the paratrooper quickly gains the upper hand. He latches on to the scientist from behind and stabs him with his own knife. Later, Ford is dragged into the laboratory being held in the air and impaled on a smeat hook. It's revenge for what the American did earlier, and the German officer takes the soldier's knife. He beats the corporal before grabbing a syringe and lecturing him. That's when Boyce interrupts, shooting Waffner, who survives several gunshots. He grabs the soldier and throws him through a window, while Ford struggles to unhook himself from the chain. The officer grabs Boyce and starts to drown him in this pool of water, but that's when Ford impales him with a metal pipe. He's injected himself with the super soldier serum, and the German soldier rushes towards the corporal before throwing him into the outer room. The two fight it out, but Ford gets overpowered and thrown into a wall knocking over a gas canister. Waffner throws him around, but then the man recovers and rolls a canister over to his feet and signals for Boyce to fire. As soon as he shoots the canister, it explodes and knocks them away. Getting back to his feet, the paratrooper helps the corporal up and carries him towards the exit, but then Ford pushes the man through a gate. After locking it from the inside, he tells Boyce the timer wasn't set and he needs to do it himself. Boyce begs him to open the gate, but he's already been injected with the serum and knows he's going to turn into a mutant. Now, Boyce is the only one that can complete the mission and destroy all the evidence of the experiments. Ford sets off this explosive, blowing up the entire area and sending boys flying. He stumbles over to the timer, activating their demolition charges, and sprints out of the bunker as fast as he can. Boyce manages to escape the compound and leaves his friend to die in the rubble, making that four commandos down, with only three surviving the mission. He arrives back at the village with a blank look on his face, traumatized with what he just witnessed, but determined to honor Ford's promise. Later, he's interrogated by this officer, who congratulates him on the amazing plan set up by Corporal Ford. Just as Boyce is about to leave, the man asks if there was a secret laboratory going on inside the compound, but the paratrooper lies, insisting there was only a radio room. With that mission done, he visits the others and realizes they've all learned an important lesson. Leaving your friends to die is only worth it if you get a shiny medal. But what do you think? How would you beat Overlord? Let me know with a comment down below. Thank you so much for watching, leave a like and subscribe, and check out the How To Be playlist for more videos like this. Until next time, have a damn good day.